Welcome to Community Conservation, a series that presents projects, ideas, and people surrounding conservation in Oregon. I'm your host, Sarah Armstrong, the Marketing Manager at Oregon Wildlife Foundation. And for those of you who are new here, we're an organization dedicated to funding wildlife and habitat conservation work throughout Oregon since 1981. I have a quick announcement. We are down to the final 815 Watch for Wildlife license plate vouchers to be sold. Here it is and I'll put something up on the screen too here, um, to be sold before this plate can actually be put into production and made available at all DMVs. Proceeds from this plate and renewal of this renewal and sales of this plate fund OWF habitat connectivity projects. So definitely reserve your plate today at myowf.org. And speaking of supporters of this campaign, On Point Community Credit Union, who are sponsoring today's episode, have generously supported our Watch for Wildlife campaign by offering this plate to their employees. Thank you also to our supporter, Wild, for being a sponsor on this episode today, and Arnrich Messina, who envision a better future by investing in those who will help make it happen. Again with me today, I have OWF Development Manager, Kalei Augustine, joining the discussion. Kalei, thanks for being here. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm super excited about this episode. Um, as we know, pollination is really important, not only for our food, but for the whole ecosystem. So stay tuned. We have a lot to learn. All right. Well, let's get to this episode and introduce our fantastic speakers. Today, we are talking about the ever fabulous and sometimes mysterious pollinators and what it means to live in relation to them as humans. Welcome Rebecca Golden, beekeeper, educator, co-owner of Bee and Bloom, and Sherry Vilmark, founder and total sum of Pollinator Parkways. Thank you both for being here. Sherry, can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Sure. I actually am really in a community education. Usually I'm teaching people how to insulate an addict or avoid lead poisoning prevention. Um, and so I utilize that skill in teaching people how to change over their front yards or parking strips into pollinator habitats. And over the last six years, um, I've flipped about 16,000 square feet of space uh, that was previously grass or otherwise useless to pollinators. So cool, such a good project. I'm really excited to show those photos later on. Um, and Rebecca, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, yes, so I'm Rebecca um, and I am one third and co-owner of Bee and Bloom. We're based here in Portland and we run a bee, honey bee apiary, an educational apiary and a bee sanctuary out of Willow Bar Farm on Savi Island. Um, and it's there that we do a lot of community engagement as well. So we have ecotourism workshops and events all surrounding pollinator conservation and then sustainable and bee-centric beekeeping. And then we also work with clients throughout the Portland metro area, both in uh, creating backyard habitat uh, and to keep hives. Well, you both have very unique insight and knowledge to share, so let's dive right in. Um, Sherry, can you start us off here from square one? Sounds great. So one of the core elements of pollinator parkways is that you can have a significant impact on pollinators with a relatively small space. We are talking about small fauna after all. And so each person with a little bit of space can actually make a pretty significant difference. I want to start off just by defining what is a pollinator, right? Bees are the most famous, but really what you have is an animal that goes from one plant to another, carrying pollen to another plant so that that plant can reproduce. And about 90 plus percent of flowering plants rely on mechanical pollination like this. <clears throat> and bees are very good at it. And I'm going to also talk about some other pollinators out there as well. <clears throat> so most famous, yes, are the bees. And you can see on the left is a bumblebee and she is completely covered in pollen. And this is exactly what makes her an incredible pollinator. <laughs> she is very messy and she will carry pollen from this aster to another aster uh, very effectively. And bees are kind of, um, they're a little bit like static charged. So that pollen sticks to them really well. And they come in a variety of sizes right now uh, in, Oregon, you're seeing really big bumblebees. Those are queens that you're seeing. And later on in the summer, uh, you will see little tiny bees the size of little sugar ants. So there's huge variety. There are actually around 4,000 species of native bee uh, here just in the continental United States. 
plus we have another 11,000 plus butterflies and moth species that also are uh, really gorgeous and eye-catching pollinators that are really easy to love, really. <laughs> but other pollinators might be a little surprising. So flies, wasps, beetles, right? These are visiting flowers. Even spiders now have come out <laughs> as if they're traveling from one flower to another. It's just about having a little bit of pollen clinging to their body. And they are also contributing to the continuation of species that rely on this mechanical pollinating. And then we also have vertebrate pollinators. Don't want to forget them. Hummingbirds, of course, a fan favorite, and bats in a lot of other parts of the country and world uh, are actually also fabulous pollinators. And it's relatively easy to make changes at home. So I <clears throat> became a homeowner myself and decided I wanted to build a pollinator habitat. And I started with a parking strip because I'm like, I don't know, it's ugly, I hate it. It's a small space, so I guess I'm not intimidated by it. And then I put down some succulents from neighbors. I'd ask people, can I have a clipping? And I'm like, you can't kill succulents. And I stuck them in my parking strip. And one day in the summer, uh, that entire, my entire parking strip bloomed and it had all these bees and butterflies. And I was chatting with a neighbor who across the street had thrown down a wildflower mix. And we could see the traffic going across their streets. And I thought, man, imagine if everybody just made like a little bit of space like this uh, for pollinators. And then I got bit by this uh, very addicting creating pollinator space, ripped out a section of my driveway, turned it into a pollinator rain garden. And what I found was really quick results. So when I had moved into my home, um, the previous owners had used a lot of chemicals, so many that when I dug in the ground, there weren't even any worms. And I would have these aphids, like the apocalypse, <laughs> like apocalyptic aphids uh, that were just destroying everything. And I was refusing to use chemicals. And I didn't really know what to do. I was blasting with water and people would like squish them. And it didn't matter. Uh, they just kept coming. But after I had built the larger pollinator habitat, which was a lot more than succulents, um, what I found was after a full year had passed, it brought predators. So uh, on the, in the middle there, that top middle is actually a ladybug larva and it eats aphids. And then as an adult, it eats aphids. Um, I had assassin bugs, leaf footed bugs, um, lots of wasps, which are also actually really great predators as well, spiders. And it also brought more birds as well. And I just noticed that. And what the research shows, right, is that if you want to have a robust predator population, you want you need a really robust prey population. Okay, one pride of lions, you got five lions, they don't eat five antelope, right? You need hundreds, maybe thousands of antelope to feed lions. And if you think of wasps like tiny little sky tigers, right? They're they're out there like hunting, same thing. So you need uh you need those like kind of pests. And I haven't had to worry about aphid since. I still have them but they don't control and dominate my space anymore. So I did a great deal of research. Um, you know, I am not an entomologist or an insectologist, but what I found from those experts is that really it comes down to several key components if you wanna have a really effective pollinator space. Those components are staggered blooming, <clears throat> native plants, and gotta ditch the chemicals. So what staggered blooming is, is it means something is blooming all the time. <laughs> in uh, Portland area, I can have stuff blooming from about February through, I've even had through November. I've had ice storms freeze my flowers before, and I can do this with native species. And the reason why this is really important is I mentioned earlier, right, queen bumblebees are out. They've been out for, I don't know, about a month, month and a half, and mason bees are also out and a variety of little teeny tiny sweat bees are out and they need forage. So if we just look at a queen, at a bumblebee, right? A queen bumblebee spent the winter like kind of hibernating in stasis and she is arisen and she is really hungry and a source of pollen and nectar is crucial to that. 
single queen bumblebee. And she will create many, many, many hundreds of bumblebees by preserving her and providing resources for her. And the same thing happens, all these bees are emerging at different times. Bumblebees come out early and they got little fur coats. They can, they can handle the chilly weather a little bit better. You got longhorn bees, which is the bee there on the right, the really long antenna, which are to woo the ladies. Uh, they come out really a lot later. And a lot of times, if you notice, gardens really kind of don't have many flowers by around August. By around the height of summer, if you look around, look around this summer, you won't see that many flowers because the flowers are kind of done. So where are these late emerging bees going to find their food? And when is next year's queen who will arrive in the fall, who will like, you know, be born? They aren't really born, but you know, uh, you'll have a fresh brand new queen who will need to overwinter and she'll need to get fat and build her stores so that she can survive. So just that one species, right, needs that staggered blooming. Plus you're gonna have a way more gorgeous strip. And by the way, that is Oregon grape on the left and Douglas Aster on the right. We have tons of gorgeous early blooming flowers. Red flower and currant, really big, eight feet across, eight or nine feet tall if it's really happy. Um, just dripping and gorgeous pink blossoms right when you're most desperate for color <laughs> after a bleak gray winter. Uh, likes full sun, it can do some part shade as well. Evergreen huckleberry uh, can get very big in the shade. It can, I've seen it reach 12 feet tall. Really, it's evergreen, as the name implies, and it creates a really lovely hedgerow. These adorable little bells uh, are open for pollination right now, and they will create an edible huckleberry at the end of the season, later on in the summer. Camas, super gorgeous, has um, huge like, historical and cultural significance. Um, it blooms very quickly. Doesn't last very long, but really gorgeous, especially if you can get a swath going. Pacific Bleeding Heart. Uh, this is a native variety. It is much, much hardier than the kinds you find in the more decorative section of uh, your gardens. Can grow in the shade really well, flourishes. It's so lush. Um, it blooms in the early spring. And then a lot of times you can get another bloom out of it in the fall. So bonus blooms. Big hummingbird magnet too, I have found. So is the red flower and currant. Hummingbirds love them. So a lot of times when I'm designing a space, I'm always like, all right, what are my early bloomers? So those are the hardest ones <laughs> I find. And then, because middle of the season bloomers are really easy, uh, what are the late bloomers? So this is where you have, um, I don't know if it's coincidence. It seems like the plants I work with, the late bloomers are the most uh, enthusiastic. <laughs> They're aggressive, but I like to call them enthusiastic. So there's Canada goldenrod, big, gorgeous yellow blooms. It's so striking and you'll see it in August it's going strong in September it's going strong an absolute magnet like you'll find every insect in your yard is just like whoosh, they're there there's not a lot blooming either uh, I couple that with aster <clears throat> a lot <coughs> on the right uh, right we have the uh, I think that's great northern aster and the white flower is called pearly everlasting which is also um, a host plant. A lot of these are host plants for butterflies, meaning that in their larval little caterpillar form, they're eating the plant, which I will touch on the value of that as well. Um, but another one that's really fun and I don't see used very often, it's too tall for parking strips, it's kind of wavy, but beautiful in the back part of a front yard is fireweed. It grows really tall and just blooms and blooms and blooms and blooms for like months sometimes. And it's just really gorgeous and um, Sherry, were you an, like an avid gardener before you got into this or this is just all you're like, okay, now this is my thing. Like I'm learning all of this now. This is my life. You know, it's funny. I'm actually kind of a bad gardener, which actually makes me really good at this because if it survives me, it'll probably survive you. I'm right and I work, <laughs> I work with a lot of people who have never gardened before and people get really bummed if all their plants die. Yeah. So um, and parking strips are brutal habitats. They get very, very hot in the summer. They're surrounded by concrete and pavement. Uh, when it rains, they're getting flooded. You got dog activity. You got people stepping on them and doors swinging on them. Um, so yeah, only the toughest <laughs> plans for me. 
another one, it's not native, but I do love sunflowers and they are a very beneficial species. And the bee, by the way, in this one, a lot of people think it's a yellow jacket, but it's not. It's actually called a metallic green sweat bee. Super beautiful. I have lots of pictures of them. <laughs> uh, and then on the right is a blanket flower. And there are a lot of varieties of blanket flower. I've seen some with black and red and yellow. Uh, can just be really just stunning on its own uh, as well. And there are, there are many more. Um, so why the focus on native plants? Like I, I remember I had thought from, I was like, oh, well, native plants are, they're like better, but that's just nice. But the more research I did, the more it was like, no, native plants are incredibly important. So I like to work in threes. So I'm going to say one of them is chemistry. So there's been a lot of uh, media coverage about the disappearance of monarch butterflies. We've lost over 90% of our not monarch butterflies in the last 30 years. And one of the big reasons is the stamping out of milkweed. Milkweed is the only plant monarch butterflies will lay eggs on. It's the only plant their caterpillars can eat. And so by taking away that host plant, we've taken away the, the crucial element of the monarch life cycle. And so this is a place too where I kind of call it, I'm like, embrace the nibble. If something is eating your plant, your plant is now a part of the ecosystem. This is actually something to celebrate. This is actually something, when I see something's chewing my plant, I'm like, ooh, where are you? And it's like a little treasure hunt to figure out who you are. Um, because caterpillars become moths and butterflies. Caterpillars are also an extremely popular snack. They're like the sausages of nature. Everybody just wants to be eating them. Birds, it's a huge element of like birds. You have wasps that lay eggs inside of them. Like you name it, they eat caterpillars. So uh, planting something like milkweed, what you're really looking for, it's great that they visit the blossoms. That's nifty. But what you're really excited about is if something is eating the leaves body of the plant is just as important as the bloom. Another element is the shape. So, I mean, we've seen versions, right? If, like, I remember as a kid, you see like, oh, here's a bird and it has this crazy looking beak. Oh, it fits perfectly into that flower. <laughs> it's not a coincidence, right? Co-evolution not only works chemically, but also in the shape of flowers. Um, bumblebees, this is another, this is actually a queen bumblebee. Uh, you can see she's got this tongue sticking out. They have long tongues. There are short-tongued bumblebees, or short-tongued bees, I'm sorry, as well. And that bee's tongue is the perfect length for that flower. So if you kind of grow, like cultivate, like one with a giant flower, it may not even have nectar or pollen left. Uh, it may not fit the tongue of that bee. And the other part is in sync. That's what the staggered blooming is about. It's not a coincidence that Oregon grape is blooming when these bees are emerging, right? They are together. And there are lots of elements in plants that's just being discovered. Insects can see ultraviolet, for example. And there are parts of plants that you can only see if you're seeing them in ultraviolet. And just talk about more natives because there's so many options. Like you don't have to settle because people will be like, well, I want really pretty flowers. I'm like, yeah, beautiful. Oh my God. Have you been on a hike? Have you gone out into our nature? Oregon is gorgeous. And I have grown up here, so I might be a tiny bit biased, but we're the most beautiful state ever. So we have lupin, there's large leaf lupin, there are also stream bank lupins, there are a wide variety. When you're shopping for something like lupin, because there are so many kind of cultivated, like weird lupins out there, a little bit of crossbreeding has made some weird lupins. You know, really, you know, you can ask a nursery to be like, hey, you know, where's the native species of lupin? Um, I do that with like almost every plant. Really try to find the Latin name or what it is you're looking for um, and work with that when you go to a nursery. One side effect is most nurseries will sell you a plant only while it's actively blooming. So if you want to create a staggered blooming situation, you have to go to the nursery many times unless you go through a wholesale vendor. Uh, there's monkey flower. Uh, if you've ever had a swampy part of your yard, like that just kind of is always a little bit like swampy. <laughs> uh, monkey flower, camas go beautifully. They will make that part of your garden like your favorite part. Uh, Lewis mock orange is a shrub, really lovely. It puts out these little white flowers, uh, smell like a little bit like creamsicle. I'm a big fan, collects 
um, definitely attracts many, many pollinators. All of these are magnets. Beach daisy is actually native to the Oregon coast, but does very, very well in Portland and is a big magnet. That open flower shape, you'll see a lot because it is a very accessible shape to a wide variety of insects. Nodding onion, really adorable little, um, it doesn't get very tall, kind of maxes out about, I don't know, eight or 10 inches, uh, can handle heat really well. And then showy milkweed is uh, one of the Oregon native milkweeds. It's very easy to grow. It's very enthusiastic. So uh, if you plant one, you will have uh, 30 and it will appear where it feels like appearing. Spreads by rhizomes <laughs> underground. So be ready for a patch, which is ideal as insects can find a three foot square foot size or larger patch of plants much easier um, than a single plant here and there. And then the other element is pesticide free spaces. I'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit on this one, I would guess, but right, this is safe spaces for you, your children, pets, wildlife, bees, insects, arachnids. One of the more kind of nefarious ones is um, systemic pesticides. A more famous one is called a neonicotinoid. These are plants that are treated before you own them. And they're in the entire plant is poison, essentially, including the pollen, including the roots, and it can last for years. Um, so this is also a space I actually have um, on my website. I called a bunch of nurseries a couple of years ago and basically made a list of the nurseries that um, either don't sell plants with neonicotinoids or label them. And because of consumer pressure, it has been changing. Because um, yeah, they found it was poisoning everything. Go figure. And then I think when it comes to planning your site, uh, this is a bit of work, I'm not gonna lie. What I find easiest is to make a to scale drawing. I just get graph paper, one little square is one square foot. And then I'm like, how big does a red flower and current get? Eight feet, okay, uh, I need to plan. <laughs> to make sure it has that much space. That way you can avoid cramscaping. I'll be honest, I, I cram every plant and every, I can't help myself. But when I'm working with other people, I don't do it to them. And then I'd say one of my most common questions is what do I do with the grass that is sitting, <laughs> uh, that is taking up my parking strip? This one is really big. I used to do this all the time, mechanical removal. Uh, it's, I would get a bunch of volunteers that never returned and they would dig up sod. Uh, if you're really into exercise, you wanna do this um, and just, you don't like what's there. You're like, just get rid of it. I just wanna do it now. I highly suggest not doing this in the summer when the ground is hard as a rock. This is usually parking strip soil is not usually very good, um, but you can, it, it's not very deep either. Sod is not very deep. So you can see like it's relatively shallow shoveling happening here. Um, and then you can like top that with compost Kind of mix it a little bit and then you can plant and dig in the same day which is why i did this uh, until i lost all my volunteers <laughs> uh if you're more patient uh for the patient uh lazy people what i do now is almost exclusively sheet mulching um i also tend to work in bigger strips so sheet mulching you wet everything down really well now is a great time of year if you want to do a fall planting sheet mulching around this time it's going to be great Get everything wet, lay down cardboard, put compost on top of that, mulch on top of that, and then you just wander off and live your life. And then when you're ready to plant, you just dig right into the ground. Uh, this is also great for sequestering the carbon that off gases from composting sod. Uh, you don't have to haul away a giant pile, 600 square feet of sod, which was a problem we had in the first years as well. So it's just, it's kind of a win-win. And then, um, and then if you plant in the fall, that is the ideal time to put a plant in the ground as far as I'm concerned, because it's dormant, like late fall, like, I don't know, is October still fall? Like late fall. <laughs> and you can, uh, the plant is just, it's, it's dormant, so it handles transplanting much, much better. You can really aggressively break up the roots, tuck them in, and then all winter long, they're getting rained on, they're growing um, quietly. I'm really glad that you're bringing this up because I saw a neighbor of mine do this, you know, like, like, you know, a couple of weeks ago, a month ago or whatever. And this whole time I've been thinking, wow, I wonder when they're going to take their cardboard up 
and oh yeah <laughs> it just rots away yeah so they and know so what they're I'm, doing i apparently have no idea what i'm doing <laughs> yeah be sure to remove the tape mm -hmm. if you do this otherwise you will be digging and tape is just plastic so yeah. you'll be like what's happening but uh yeah that is what's happening if right on. Wow. if you're in a really narrow strip if you have a strip that's only say three feet three and a half feet deep uh you're gonna want to i mean you're gonna want to make sure anyway but like it's it stacks stuff up and it's such a narrow space uh usually what i'll do is kind of dig a little trench about six inches wide around the whole thing so that soil mulch is not um, contaminating our stormwater. Mm -hmm. Soil is a big contaminant in our stormwater systems. You don't want dirt and soil just running down the street. Uh, that's that's bad news for the environment. It's a different lecture, but I'll lecture you all now. Don't do that. So dig a little trench, and then it'll also it'll also keep the grass from creeping up around the edges because grass is very persistent to get rid of. All right, that is my presentation. Oh, I will throw out just one thing. On the left. That is not a bee. It's actually a fly faking being a bee. And you can tell, I can always tell, I can spot the flies uh, because if you look at their face, it definitely looks like a fly. It has little teeny tiny antenna. And the one on the right is a bee, even though it often looks like a wasp to people. So uh, hoverflies, <laughs> right? What was that? A real optical illusion there. <laughs> Yeah, like you just, once you start looking, you, you have so much more diversity once you build a habitat inside your little environment than you realize. And that fly, by the way, uh, there are a lot of hoverfly species. Those are the ones you'll see, it's like, it looks like a little bee and it's just stopped in midair and it seems like they're just stuck in time. Their larvae are big aphid consumers. I have a lot of opinions about eating aphids. So they're really good aphid consumers and they're pollinators as adults. So win-win, all signs of healthy gardens. Wow, and um, and Pollinator Parkways is still just a Southeast Portland operation that you're doing, right? Or have you expanded? No, I mostly, um, I, I do this as a volunteer in addition to a regular job. So mm -hmm. I'm mostly just in the Montevilla area. And I'll probably after this season actually kind of move more into a consulting and slightly less hands-on because it's just an incredible amount of time yeah, but I'd like to make more educational videos that walk people through elements so that they can do it themselves. And I'll probably won't be able to stay for away forever. I'll probably because <laughs> I do every year. I'm like, oh, I'm so tired. And then I do the planting, and then it's so much fun. And then people send me pictures of their gardens, and they they're so. I mean, I had one lady who she just became connected to her neighbors through her project because she made this gorgeous. She really took good care of it, um, and. She had neighbors talking to her for the first time and she would actually sit out in her chair like on the sidewalk waiting for people to comment and she would <laughs> chat with them and she was like she's like this project like just changed my life and stuff like that like really surprises me but i think we all want to connect through nature we all want to connect through like i mean flowers like are just so beautiful and a beautiful garden is one that i think is buzzing with life and activity and creates baby birds and creates, you know, safe spaces and sanctuary inside of an urban setting. Yeah, well said. Um, well, I mean, thank you so much for giving us that overview. I feel like you're already on your way to creating if you don't already have some kind of video series like in your back pocket going already for your next um, next stages of this project. I mean, this is a fantastic overview and, um, you know, laying the foundation for letting us know what native pollinators are and our shared habitat habitat together, what to keep an eye out for this summer too. Very valuable. Yeah. Um, thank well, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And Rebecca, I know that you have a slightly, maybe not different perspective, but you're gonna help us kind of focus in on what it means to be a beekeeper or this beekeeper life. Yeah, absolutely. So we will be talking about honeybees, uh, but all, all bees. We're going to be talking about becoming a melatologist, which is a fancy word for lover of all bees, <laughs> essentially, or someone who studies them or uh, interacts with them. So uh, yes, we are going to be beaking out for the rest of the uh, episode today and talking about the road to becoming a master melatologist or an amateur melatologist. Um, and so step number one is definitely to take every opportunity to make a bee pun. Uh, you'll have a lot of fun doing that and get a lot of laughs from people who enjoy dad jokes like uh, myself. 
but um, everybody's road to beakdom is a little bit different. Um, mine started as a young child who was just obsessed with all things in nature and all animals. I really wanted to be just like Jane Goodall and moved to Africa and live with chimps. And so uh, when I went to college in my undergrad, I went to the University of Arizona and I studied ecology and evolutionary biology, and I really focused on animal behavior. And so uh, in an animal behavior course, I got an opportunity to work as a research assistant with uh, Dan Pappage down there. And so we studied, uh, We had, there were several different studies on uh, bumblebee behavior. So uh, we looked at how bumblebees basically perceive different floral cues. Uh, like Sherry was talking about, there are a lot of morphological traits that a plant can have that will fit with certain pollinators or with certain bees. Um, and with bumblebees in particular, they're very generalist species, and so they visit many, many different types of plants. Uh, they need to because they're active for a very long period of the year. Um, and so we were looking at how they learn which plants to form preferences for, because an individual can specialize and really maximize the amount of pollen or nectar that they're collecting from any one plant. Um, and so there were three main studies that I got a chance to work on uh, where bumblebees would learn whether a cue was informative for them or not. So uh, they might learn that a larger flower uh, is indicative of more nectar if that is the case. But if they're also presented with another species where a larger flower has no relation to whether it has a larger nectar reward, they can learn to disregard that uh, cue as well. And so they're incredibly smart. They're able to learn their environments really, really well um, and develop preferences for flowers. And so you can imagine these bees are directly influencing which plants are being pollinated and then which plants are actually reproducing and thriving in our communities. And so it's this really tight knit relationship that has a huge impact on our local ecosystem ecosystems. And my mind was just blown by everything that I was learning. And I fell down the rabbit hole and started learning about all bees. And uh, there were more kinds than I ever could have thought of. And I was able to, you know, look at any blooming plant and observe nature uh, rather than having to, you know, fly across the globe uh, to <laughs> live with all of the, uh, the amazing Apes, but uh, this whole world was even more diverse uh, and uh, more mind blowing than I ever could have imagined. And so after graduating, I moved to Portland and met some uh, kindred spirits uh, in my business partners. This is Emma and Emily, uh, my fellow Beaks, and we founded BM Bloom in 2017. And so we've been working uh, mostly in a community outreach capacity um, and really trying to bridge the gap between uh, conservation research that is happening and people who are landowners or people who are interested in keeping bees um, to have kind of the best approach to uh, these practices. And so we do host workshops and, or we did <laughs> host workshops and classes and uh, we do experiences and things like that. Um, we haven't quite gotten back up to speed yet since um, lockdown and COVID, but we will be doing this again uh, eventually. <laughs> And uh, we also have, because of this, have started doing a lot of virtual content. Um, and so a lot of that is available as well um, and to be applied in your own properties or in your own lives. And we also work with a lot of clients, uh, people who are interested in beekeeping or getting hives in their backyards. And uh, usually we'll ask people what their goals are when they're getting into this. Um, I'll be, the first to admit that it's um, a very challenging hobby to get into, and it uh, can be one that has a lot of heartbreak, um, unfortunately, uh, these days. So uh, I think it is one of the most fun and rewarding hobbies that you can have. Um, and there's kind of a larger scope that I will generally ask people to think about uh, when they're considering getting honey beehives. 
but uh, number one really is culture. So humans have a very close cultural relationship with honeybees we have for thousands of years. The one species of honeybee we have here in North America is European. So it was introduced in the 1600s uh, with European settlers as producers of honey and beeswax. Um, and so this changed a little bit uh, during uh, industrialization and when we needed to produce more food uh, for our country. And so um, now honeybees are responsible for pollinating about 35% of our crops. Um, and that's because we have these large monoculture crops that only bloom for a certain period of the year and it takes up a whole bunch of habitat. So bees that would otherwise live in those habitats can't. Um, and so it requires trucking in hundreds and thousands of honey beehives in order to do these massive pollination events in order to produce that crop or to produce seed for that crop. Um, in a smaller scale, or if you are looking at having a backyard hive, uh, pollination isn't going to be as much of a concern. You're not going to have as much of a measurable impact on pollination uh, of food crops. You may see um, in a slight increase in garden yields, uh, but those increases are better observed by uh, conserving or preparing habitat or protecting native bees. Uh, but if you're looking for a hobby, uh, that is something that you can bring your community or your family together with, uh, something where uh, you just wanna interact with another organism, a large buzzing super organism, and kind of have teachable moments uh, for biology or with STEM with children, or if you just yeah want to have fun doing it, uh, those are all really great reasons for keeping honey beehives. But uh, you should know that it's very challenging and will require a certain amount of research and um, investment in order to do it well. Um, something else to keep in mind when you're talking about conservation and pollination is when you introduce non-native insects or non-native pollinators in large amounts like with honey beehives uh, they do pollinate invasive plants and so this is scotch broom um, and honey bees love scotch broom and will pollinate it and so it's kind of giving an extra edge to plants that already have an edge uh, in the ecosystems and so these plants aren't necessarily visited by native pollinators as much as honeybees are non-native pollinators and so they can have that kind of impact um, on our local ecosystems as well and uh, they are also vectors for certain pathogens and parasites and diseases to wild bee species that we have um, and so those are all considerations when you are uh, introducing a non-native species um, in a measurable way to your environments but there is there are good ways to do it it's kind of just all keeping things in balance but if you're more interested in community conservation then uh it's more about these guys and so these are the native bees of the pacific northwest as sherry mentioned there are about four thousand in north america and now we think there are about at least 630 species of bee that live in oregon and they are incredibly diverse. And so most of the associations people have with bees are, you know, queens and workers and drones and honey and living in large colonies. But about 90% of our wild species are solitary. Um, and most of those live underground. Um, and they all are different, are active at different stages and are of all sizes, shapes, colors. They have hairs in different places of their body, depending on where they're gathering pollen from. And so it's just, they're incredibly diverse. There's this huge range of species out there. Um, and so when you are creating pollinator habitat, one of the best things to look out for is who's visiting and who you have. And so we're gonna go over different groups of bees or different types of bees that you might actually see on your plants uh, throughout this whole process. And so uh, I mentioned earlier, most bees are solitary and most of those live in the ground. Um, and so that can look a couple of different ways, but mostly it's gonna be a single female that will take care of her own offspring. And so she'll dig a tunnel usually in a sloped area or a place that has um, ground cover over bare soil. Um, and so if you have, you know, like a wild strawberry plant that kind of has creeping leaves that go over, that's often a place where we'll see ground nesting bees kind of underneath those covered areas. Um, and so they'll dig a tunnel down into the ground and then they'll have these little chambers that come off the sides. And it's in those chambers that a female will bring pollen back to the nest. She'll groom it into a little ball or a little loaf of 
be bred. She'll lay an egg on it and that egg will hatch and eat all of the food left behind by its mother. So most of the time or most of a bee's life is actually going to be spent in its development mental stage. Um, and so on, in the case of ground nesting bees, that would be underground. Um, and so it'll eat all of the food left behind by its mother, go through its entire larval stage in that little chamber, and then it'll spin a cocoon in that cell and pupate. Um, and so in that pupation process, they'll start forming eyes and legs and wings, um, and then they'll hibernate in some form. So some species will hibernate as larvae or, or pre pupae underground or as fully formed adults in their cocoons or in a pupal phase. Um, and so then it'll uh, dig its way out of its cell as a fully formed adult next season, usually in order to start the process over again. So uh, maybe, and maybe I missed this, but are you saying, sure. so it takes like a whole year or a whole, maybe like a, like a third of a year or something like that? Usually, yeah. Um, and so yeah. there are some species that uh, have a bivoltine uh, life cycle. And so sometimes they'll have two generations that will emerge within the span of the same, the same season. There are some leaf cutter bees that will do this. Um, but most of the time they'll have uh, that entire year of development and some form of hibernation before they actually are fully formed adults that are flying from flower to flower. Gosh, cool. Um, and so of the solitary ground nesters, here are some of the most common ones. I included cuckoo bees because this is such a diverse group of solitary bee that we have in North America. They don't really nest. <laughs> um, and so I hesitate to kind of loop them in with ground nesters uh, because they uh, will actually lay their eggs in another bee's nest uh, that will then eat the pollen that was forged by that other bee. And so they're uh, like cuckoo birds in that sense. Um, but some of these have already been highlighted by Sherry tonight. And so uh, like a longhorn bee is going to be a ground nester that's active later in the season. They're some of my favorites. The uh, females have these incredible scope or pollen collecting hairs on their back legs that look like leg warmers. Um, the males have these really, really long antennae that they use to smell females. Um, but they have these like super exaggerated features that I find incredibly cute. Um, and then we have green metallic sweat bees. Um, there are helictus sweat bees that don't have that green metallic uh, sheen. Uh, there are andrinus or mining bees. Um, and all of these will have that similar strategy of nesting in the ground, whether, uh, you know, the each each female has an individual nest. Sometimes these species will share a nest opening and then have kind of a long chamber or a long tunnel that they'll all share and have their own little nesting compartments. But ultimately they need like that bare patchy ground that has some kind of cover. Generally they'll need a sandier soil texture. And if they can have something with good drainage, like on a slope, if you can leave areas of a slope without grass um, or without being mowed or without being trampled on a lot that gets good sun and good drainage. Those are all going to be really, really great habitats for solitary ground nesting bees that you can incorporate into your uh, parkways or into any kind of uh, landscaping design that you're doing for your pollinator gardens. All right, and then bumblebees. So bumblebees are probably the most known group of native bees we have in North America. And there are a lot of species of bumblebee. Um, the most common one you'll see here is going to be this yellow-faced bumblebee or Bombus vasinensky. I'm not entirely sure if I say that right. Um, I, I should say, <laughs> When you're trying Latin names, the key is confidence, uh, which I know can be really hard <laughs> to do, but I, you know, people will say it however they're going to say it. Um, but bumblebees are social bees. And so this is the only group of truly social bee we have in North America. And they nest in colonies of hundreds of in individuals, whereas, you know, honeybees are social and have thousands of individuals. Bumblebees have hundreds of individuals and they'll nest usually underground. There are some species like Bombus melanopygus or melanopygus uh, that will nest in birdhouses and they have a little rusty uh, stripe on their back abdomen, uh, but usually they'll be finding abandoned uh, mammal burrows or things like that in uh, spaces for uh, starting their colonies or in a compost pile <laughs> or in a debris pile um, or in areas where you have kind of a less tidy or manicured area um, of your yard. 
Uh, of the bumblebee species, these are some of the most common. This is that Melanopigus or black-tailed bumblebee that I was talking about that might sometimes nest in a birdhouse. If you have uh, bumblebees in a birdhouse, it's like nine times out of 10, it's gonna be these guys. Um, and then here's that yellow face again. We do have Californias and brown belted. Um, and beyond uh, the uh, common ones that we have that are native to here, there are some introduced bumblebee species as well that do hail from North America, but usually there's this uh, geographic barrier of the Rocky Mountains where you have species to the east and species to the west. Um, but like Bombus impatiens or the common Eastern bumblebee has been introduced like crazy uh, west of the Rockies now. And so we do have those as well, but then we have some that are solitary tunnel nesting bees. So these are solitary as well, but rather than nesting in the ground, they will find um, holes <laughs> to nest in up off of the ground. And so they'll find holes in dead wood, um, sometimes that have been you know, bored by beetles um, or woodpeckers. They might find hollowed reeds or stems. Um, so like if you have cane berries like raspberries, there are some tunnel nesting or hole nesting bees that will uh, nest in kind of those pithy stems like that. Um, but these bees can be managed. Um, and so you can actually put habitats up or man-made habitats with tunnels for them. Um, once you do that, once you're introducing a larger population of one particular bee in one concentrated area, there are, are, are some maintenance things that you have to do to protect them or make sure that they're thriving. Um, and so if you're interested in, you know, maintaining mason bees or leaf cutting bees, there are some things that you will have to do to help me maintain those habitats, um, rather than doing, you know, kind of a set, a set it and forget it or creating natural habitat like you would for those ground nesting bees. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind if you do get these bee hotels or bee houses, uh, that it is a little bit more involved. It's still very, very easy. It's not like having a honey bee hive, um, but uh, that is something just to keep in mind. And then uh, these are some of the more common ones that you may see. Um, of course, we have uh, many species of mason bee. These are two different species. This one is Osmia lignaria, which is native, and then Osmia cornifrons, which is not. <laughs> um, and then many leaf cutting bees uh, that will come out in the summer and will nest in a similar uh, bee house or managed bee house structure like a mason bee would in earlier spring. Um, and then we have some resin bees or wool carter bees or other bees in the family Megachylidae that kind of contains all of these um, solitary tunnel nesters. Um, but uh, some of them d are less common and less uh, successfully managed to, to have these larger populations like a resin bee. All right, which leads me to the Oregon Bee Project. So as you're observing kind of this boom in life, uh, there are other ways that you can contribute to conservation through kind of a citizen science uh, perspective or through collaboration with other entities. Um, so for Oregon Bee Project, this is out of Oregon State University Extension in uh, partnership with a couple of government agencies. So uh, the main program goals are uh, to protect bees from pesticide exposure, increase habitat, reduce impact of disease and pests on bees, and then to just in general, expand our understanding of bees in Oregon. And so they work with farmers, beekeepers, pesticide applicators, land managers, and volunteers uh, to accomplish these goals. And then the main one that I'll be talking about for the rest of the evening is the Bee Atlas Project. So this is the Oregon Bee Atlas through the Oregon Bee Project uh, and the Master Melitologist Program that's through that. And I'm actually in my first year of doing this program. Um, but ultimately, the goal of it is to have an up-to-date uh, database of all of the bee species that we have here in Oregon, and then a lot of really great information like the host plants and their locations and how their populations change over time uh, so that we can influence conservation changes and uh, new laws and new legislature to protect pollinators in general. And so these are the first published findings uh, from 2018 of this project. And so this was the first year that it happened. They only had 52 volunteers in the entire state of Oregon at that time. And uh, in that first year, they were able to collect 
11,000 different specimens of bee uh, from over 33 counties. And I believe they were able to uh, identify over 400 different species from um, most of these genera just from this one year. And so this is all going into a map uh, to uh, track over time. And uh, the program has grown quite a bit since then, and they're still kind of going through all of the specimens and all of the data that's been collected by these volunteers and by the master melatologist uh, participants. And um, now they are estimating, and it's from the Oregon Bee Atlas and the Oregon Bee Project that we now know that there are at least 630 different species of bee living here in Oregon. Rebecca, I have to know, how do they get those samples? How do they get yeah. them? Do they great. them? Yeah, great question. A trap or something? <laughs> so it starts with a butterfly net. Um, so it's it ends up being a lot of uh, these beaks uh, standing in front of a certain plant and then just watching and waiting for bees to come by, swooping the net, um, and then collecting that sample in a particular jar. Um, and so once they have that sample in the jar, and then uh, you can pin it and preserve it and go through the identification process. And then all of those bees end up getting sent to the Oregon State uh, insect um, collection or to their insect museum. Uh, and uh, then from there, all of the identifications can be verified. So there is some training that takes place and it is uh, with dissecting microscopes usually because uh, identifying bees is really, really tough um, to species. They have minute differences and minute details. Um, and then all of those collections are being held. Sometimes uh, genetic analyses are happening on them to confirm findings, um, but there is a head taxonomist, Lincoln Best, uh, who verifies everything. Um, and so he has, you know, this huge collection to go through and verify and just is a huge wealth of information uh, that will be helping to uh, push conservation legislature through. Thank you. Of course. And uh, so you can get involved in this. Um, you can become a certified master melatologist through Oregon State. Um, and uh, if that is something that you're not totally sure you want to dedicate all of your time to, or you know, you're uh, more at the amateur level or want to maintain that and just be a bee enthusiast on your own, but you still want to support this, uh, you can donate uh, to the Oregon Bee Atlas as well. And then uh, definitely take advantage of all of the bee friendly resources and tools that they have. Um, and so at OregonBeeProject.org, you know, whether you are a beekeeper or an educator, there is a lot of really great information for teaching these uh, topics to children, um, for pesticide applicators and landscapers. This is just a huge wealth of information and really is kind of a compendium of information. And so they have uh, taken a lot of resources from a lot of different places and they're all available here. Um, and yeah, it's just really the, the best spot to go browse around if you have uh, any uh, interest or curiosity in bees and how to protect them. And then uh, there's Bumblebee Watch. Um, and so this has been an Atlas uh, project that's been happening for quite some time now, and it's um, nationally. Uh, and so if you create an account on Bumblebee Watch, you can take a photo of one on a plant and submit that to their uh, database and to their records. And they have entomologists do identifications or verifying your identifications. And then they have this kind of heat map that they're creating. Um, and so all of that information uh, is going toward uh, research for legislation as well. Um, and it is a little bit less involved and maybe more at the beginner level if you're just getting into bees and becoming a bee enthusiast. And uh, the app that uh, the Oregon Bee Atlas uses is just iNaturalist. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so all of the uh, bee submissions that we make are connected to the host plants that they're found on. Um, and so through iNaturalist, we're able to take pictures and identify the plants that uh, the bees were found on. And so that's like a whole other layer of information with these maps as well, or are these host plant interactions that we have with different bee species. Um, and it can be yeah, incredibly informative.
All right. And uh, that's all I have for you tonight. Um, I do have a lot of this information and follow up resources compiled uh, at this uh, page here, bmbloom.com slash ODBF community conservation. Um, and yeah, yeah, so anything that I talked about that you might be interested in clicking on or learning more about can be found there. Thank you so much. Um, I have, I personally have a follow question that I know I have a couple um, submissions for a QA as well, but I'm wondering when you were talking about um, hive maintenance, what mm -hmm. are you, what would you say are like the top or the top thing to be mindful of when it comes to, you know, keeping a hive itself? I've heard like mites, but I don't know yeah. if that's true. Oh, is it mites? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's kind of number one. So there's um, an invasive parasitic mite called the Varroa mite or Varroa destructor is its Latin name go figure. Wow. <laughs> um, so it was introduced in the 1980s um, and it's transmitted uh, a lot of different ways. Um, and so there are two kind of life cycle phases of a mite itself. So they have a phoretic stage where they're on the bodies of adult bees um, eating their fat bodies. And so adult bees can pick up those mites on flowers or uh, by rubbing bodies with another bee, which is something that they do in large colonies. Mm -hmm. um, and then those mites, once they're in a honeybee colony, a pregnant female can drop off uh, into a a brood cell. So where the uh, larvae or the larval bees are developing and then it can reproduce. And so it just, uh, it spreads like crazy. Um, and honeybees have a tendency to rob from one another and kind of just spread them all over the place. But it's also these mites um, vector viruses. And so they vector uh, deformed wing virus and uh, many others that uh, will infect wild bees and specifically bumblebees as well. Um, and so those are all uh, really major concerns and managing your hive for mites is the most important thing that you can do to both protect your hives and keep them alive, but then also to protect wild bees. I mean, so that's really, it's to be a successful beekeeper now, you have to be like an integrated pest management specialist and know, you know, just everything about the life cycle of these mites um, in order to do well. Um, and beyond that, I mean, there's a lot of maintenance things that uh, you need to uh, take care of when you're establishing a colony for the first time. So keeping your hive alive through its first year is a huge effort. And so it requires a lot of feeding um, and, uh, inspections and maintenance just to make sure that they make it through that first year. And there are a lot of pickups that can happen, but most of the time um, mites are the big killer. Gotcha. I mean, so far I'm in between the fashion and like, the, <laughs> like you're talking about them going, um, like going into each other's nests and like stealing food or like stolen identities, like Sherry was talking about. But <laughs> very, totally. very interesting characters out there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, honeybees are incredibly fascinating. Don't get me wrong. It's like a total soap opera in there. Uh, and watching it all unfold can be just really dramatic and, yeah. and uh, really fun. Um, but I mean, I would definitely, yeah, it's it's just a lot of information and it's a lot to know in order to do it well um, and to not have a negative impact on the environment by doing it. Um, and so if that is something that you're interested in, I would definitely recommend reading a lot, taking classes first. Um, and, you know, if you're interested in, you know, like a, a bee suit selfie or anything like that, once we do open back up to the public, we'll have experiences where you can do suited up hive tours and things like that to scratch that itch. So. Right on. And Bee and Bloom is still on, um, uh, on Savi Island, correct? Yes. Yeah. We're uh, based out of Savi Island. That's where our educational apiary is, but then uh, we are also just active throughout the Portland metro area uh, with all of our clients. Great. Um, thank you so much for that presentation and bringing this all together with the bees. Um, My pleasure. I, I do have, yeah, I have a couple of questions that were submitted um, last week about pollinators and both of you, please feel free to chime in with any answers that you might have for either of these. Um, I have from, I have a question from Joe. What's up with murder hornets and are they coming back? I don't know if either of you know the answer to that. Those I know a little bit, but so I would I would probably defer to Rebecca. They are not the hazard that they will spread. I know, but that's right. Good. Yeah, I think the the branding of a murder hornet or using the word murder definitely uh, took advantage of people's twenty twenty 
panic (laughs) in general. We're like, oh, what's next? Now we're in murder (laughs) hornets. Um, But they... Uh, they've been pretty isolated in their introduction, uh, and the uh, Washington State Department of Agriculture has done an amazing job surveying and monitoring the situation and making sure that they're not establishing here. It's definitely not a cause for panic, um, and I mean, I yeah, I just w- wouldn't worry about it uh, yet, hopefully ever. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's an introduced species, an introduced social species. There is always uh, opportunity for them to expand. But the Washington State Department of Agriculture is like really on top of it. And they have a ton of support because people are really worried about it. So. <laughs> yeah, I'd say one thing not to do is kill it and then ask what it is later. Yeah. I've been a part of multiple insect groups who are like, I killed this murder hornet. Is a murder hornet? They're like, no, that is a completely harmless and beneficial bee or um, a solitary wasp, which isn't even capable of stinging you, looks yeah. nothing like a murder hornet. So <laughs> uh, yeah, don't panic. Fair yeah, last year, a lot of queen bumblebees ended up getting uh, mistaken for them. And so- bet, yeah. Oh, bummer. Media. Um, thank you. Thank you for those answers. Um, and Kalei, I know that you had a submission as well. Yeah, um, speaking of wasps, actually, um, Anna asked, um, what's up with wasps? (laughs) She said she heard that they pollinate figs and like burrow into them and lay larva. Is this true? Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, so fig fig wasps. Eating a wasp? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. So fig wasps uh, do have that as part of their life cycle and the males uh, get stuck in there after they do their deed. And so, yeah, when you eat a fig, there's a little, I guess, I mean, they're, they're decomposed (laughs) by that point. Um, And so it's just a little bit of extra protein, a little bit of nutrition in there. Um, Wasp. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but wasps are actually the largest group of animals we have in the world. Um, and so we used to wow. think it was beetles. Now we know it's wasps, or I don't know if there's a complete consensus out on that or whether the beetle people and the wasp people are still battling that one out. Um, but uh they are incredibly diverse. So like we were talking about all the different types of bees, there's like even more uh, of that when it comes to wasps. And so uh, yellow jackets kind of give wasps a bad name, but most of them are teeny tiny or parasitic or parasitoids. All of them are uh, beneficial in some capacity, including yellow jackets, which are detritivores and that will clean up, you know, a lot of the dead material in our environments. Um, And so, yeah, they're nothing to be scared of uh, or anything like that. I don't know if that's what they're getting at, but yeah, there is just like a whole other world of just wasps in general too uh, that is super fascinating. Yeah, wasps as pest management are, it, you know, if if you want to see um, bald-faced hornets, which are actually also a type of yellow jacket or yellow jackets or paper wasps, these are vespid eusocial wasps that they, they make a nest and you have most of wasps are solitary as well. But even if you're watching, like they like to come like they like to come near flower buds, right? They're like plucking up, they're plucking up little protein, like like aphids, uh, like caterpillars. (laughs) And if you want to get into a real fun horror show, if you're at all into horror, uh, look up parasitoid wasps because if you've ever seen like the movie Aliens, it's the same concept. They will lay their eggs inside of their host. And then the eggs will hatch inside, and then the larva will eat the like the critter from inside, and then come busting out, and they're a wasp. And uh, I've come across aphid husks that are like that. You can tell that. Um, so th- sometimes the wasps are so tiny, and you don't even notice them. You're totally taking them for granted. So I've come a long way with my wasp love. I'm I'm into wasps now, but I don't usually lead with it uh, when I'm talking people into making habitat. To be yeah, honest, that sounds horrifying. Yeah, <laughs> it's really cool. East Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District, just to plug them, have a couple of really fabulous workshops on beneficial insects and uh, and pollinators, and I highly recommend both of them. So good, so interesting. 
Um, yeah, a plug to all soil and water conservation districts, now that you mention it. If you're working on pollinator habitat or any project like that, they provide like technical assistance. Um, so they'll have like techs come out and help you assess your property situation. They'll help you pay for it. Um, and then, yeah, they have all kinds of amazing workshops and stuff too. So yeah. native plant sales. It's a really yep. great way to get <laughs> native plants for cheap. Audubon Society also has native plant sales because what's good for birds is good for insects. Really, what's good for insects is good for birds. I should lead it that way. <laughs> um, well, speaking of plugs, um, we're wrapping up here. I'm wondering, you know, do either of you want to plug how people can stay in touch? I know you both have mentioned, you know, um, in your various sections, but last plugs for either of you. Um, yeah, uh, so you can follow BM Bloom on social media. So we, our Instagram is at BM Bloom. Um, and I think our Facebook is at BM Bloom US. Uh, I'm sure we have a Twitter and stuff like that too, but I don't know what the handle is. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, we have a YouTube channel that we've been starting as well. Right on. Uh, yeah, Pollinator Parkways has a Facebook, and that's about <laughs> it. Uh, but I'm pretty active on it. And then there's both a Facebook group that is one way me posting things. And then there's also a group where people can share information with each other and Sometimes there's like little plant giveaways or that's a lot of funny memes, really. There's a lot of insect <laughs> memes out there, a lot of pollinator memes. You guys are missing out if you don't um, know about them. <laughs> well, I know that you said that you're um you have scared away a few volunteers in the past, but are you accepting volunteers or do you want volunteers this year for anything? So at this point, because um because of sheet mulching, it's taken out so much of the lab the labor. Sometimes I will have a volunteer group uh, come out and then I'll organize people to do like planting, which is really fun and easy and really satisfying if I've got some really big installs. So I'd say it kind of varies. A lot of times if I want to do it, I work with Solve Oregon, yeah. which is a really great place if you want to do, if you want to find environmental work or create your own project. If you work with them, they'll provide shovels and bags for collecting trash or if you're doing a cleanup project. and they provide all of that uh, for free and um, you just fill out a really simple application. So a lot of times I'll work with them if I want a lot of volunteers. Very cool. Yeah, we have a, um, a new fiscally sponsored project, a group up in uh, St. John's called Friends of Baltimore Woods, and they uh, partner with Solve very frequently for neighborhood cleanups, you know, um, planting or um, taking invasive species away and, and things like that. They're great. All right, Clay, do you have any final thoughts, any final questions? That you'd like to include? Um, yeah, quick question. Um, for people who don't have a curb strip and maybe have a sunny spot on their balcony or something, um, can most of the plants, Sherry, that you talked about be in pots to create a, a potted pollinator garden? Or are there a few that you would point out that would be extra good in pots? Yeah, so it depending on the size of pot, right? If you've got like a half a wine barrel size pot versus little pots. Um, yeah, I would say that there are some really great, really fun annuals. There's uh, meadow foam, which is also called like poached eggplant. It's really bright yellow and white. It's so cute. Um, California poppy is another great annual that doesn't require a lot of space. They'll grow in the cracks in your sidewalk. Um, yarrow uh, is, does really well. And succulents also do really well in pots. Um, I've had mixed luck with other plants, a lot of the plants that I work with are extremely drought resistant, which means really deep roots. Mm -hmm. um, and they want more than what a pot can give, but mm -hmm. those would be good too. And then also a, a lot of great herbs too. Like if you grew like oregano, that'll attract a lot of like little bees and you can use it for cooking. And like they grow that. very well. That sounds good. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, thank you again both so much for being here, sharing your time and expertise. And thank you, Kalei, for being on the panel today. And thanks to our sponsors for this episode, Arnrich Messina, On Point Community Credit Union, and Wild. And thank you to everyone who was able to join the broadcast and live speaker chat of this episode. We release community conservation episodes monthly with wide ranging topics and a link to this discussion will be sent to your registered email so that you can share with friends or even watch it again. This series would not be possible without the collaboration of presenters and of course you are dedicated supporters. So thank you so much and we will see you again next time.